So guys, um, you're really welcome today. And um, we're delighted to have um, Brian Burke from Birdwatch Ireland with us for this webinar um, on winter biodiversity. So you can probably guess that the focus is going to be on birds. Um, and this is the, um, the second of our seasonal biodiversity challenges. Um, so last, um, in this autumn, we had a, a biodiversity challenge on seeds where we asked um, schools to try and find and identify the most different types of seeds. And we were delighted to have lots of lovely entries, um, but we did pick two winners. So I want to say a big congratulations to Kilpacanti National School and St. Felix National School, who did some brilliant work collecting and identifying different types of seeds. So big well done um, to you both. It was great to see the work done. Um, and we will be sending you both out um, um, a biodiversity poster pack. So look out for that in the post. Um, and this um, this winter, our next challenge is going to be all about bird watching. Um, so Brian is going to tell you in a few minutes how you can take part um, in a bird watch survey. Um, and what we are asking you to do as well as fill out the survey and send it on to, to Brian and Birdwatch. If you'd like to win a, a poster prize from us, is to just send us a picture um, either of your survey or of students taking part in bird watching, um, or of a spotter sheet that you've ticked um, to show us what you've been up to. Um, and you can either send that um, by email to bioevents at eu.antashka.org, or you can tag us, tag us on um, social media. Um, so, to, like I said, to, today's um, webinar is all about bird watching. Um, if anyone else in your school would have liked to have seen it, um, but they couldn't make it today, we will be recording this webinar and it will be up on our YouTube channel later. Um, but you, none of your screens will be featured. It will just be the facilitator screen. So don't worry about keeping your camera on or off. Um, but we would ask you to keep your, your microphone on mute. We have quite a big group today, just about 50 schools here, which is great. Um, but do feel free to ask and answer any questions that come up in the chat box. So we're going to leave um, a bit of time at the end for any questions you do have um, for Brian. And if you do want to say hello in the chat and tell us um, where you're from, um, you know, what county you're coming from today, feel free to do that. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're delighted to be joined by Brian Burke from Birdwatch Ireland. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, hand over to you, Brian. Great. Um, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here talking to you. Um, I was telling Claire before that I was involved in the Green Schools Committee in my school 24 years ago um, in Roscommon. So it's very cool now to be talking to everyone here. Um, I am going to try and share my screen. Okay. Yep. Great. okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the Irish Garden Bird Survey. So why do people do the Irish Garden Bird Survey? Um, it's a really good way to find out how the birds are doing in your area. Um, and it's really good if a lot of schools are doing it where you can compare and contrast and see what birds you get in your garden versus what's in, in other schools' gardens or other people's gardens. Um, it's a really good way to understand how the birds across the whole country are doing. So it's great if you guys are taking part in the survey um, and there's, you know, hundreds of people all over the country taking part. And if they send all of their bird counts to me, um, I can put them all together and we can see, you know, how are each species doing this winter? And we can compare that to how they did in previous winters. And we can see, are those birds doing really well? And some of the birds maybe aren't doing so well. And we can look into the reasons that why that might be. Um, it's also a really good way to learn to identify birds. So it doesn't matter if you only know a few birds at the moment. Um, when you're doing the survey, you know, you'll know a few birds and you'll be able to count them and record them. And any birds that you're not familiar with or you haven't seen before, um, it's a really good motivation and a really good way to, you know, spend a bit of time watching them and do a bit of detective work afterwards to try and figure out exactly what bird you're looking at. Um, and the other bit is it's a really easy survey to do. So it, it's really, really simple. Everyone can do it. Um, some of my work involves getting up really, really early before it's bright, driving for an hour and going to some big wetland, for example. It might be very cold. It might be really wet. 
Um, and there might be hundreds and thousands of birds in front of me and I have to count every single one of them. And that is a tough day at work. Um, the Garden Bird Survey is very, very easy. It's a small number of birds usually. It's a small number of species and you can do it from inside the classroom or inside your kitchen or whatever else you want. Um, so it's very, very easy from that point of view. This is what we call the survey form. So it's just one sheet of paper, front and back. Um, you don't have to worry about the little details there, but basically on the front it asks, where is your garden? It asks, is it in a town or a city? Is it maybe on the edge of a town or a city? Or is it out in the countryside? Um, roughly, what size is your garden? Um, is it about the size of a tennis court? Is it maybe a bit bigger than that, a bit smaller than that? Um, what type of food you put out for the birds in your garden? Because that will influence what birds come and visit. Um, so it's a few very simple questions so we get an idea of what your garden is like. Um, and then on the back of the page is a list of species and there's some spaces to write in um, species that maybe you saw that other people don't see too much. And the survey runs on a weekly basis. So you count the birds you see this week or starting next week. Um, and then every uh, every week you start a new line, basically. And you can see how your numbers are changing over the course of the winter. Um, for anyone take apart from their garden, the survey runs from next week to the end of February. So that's 13 weeks. We ask people to do as many weeks as they can. I know for schools, you're going to be off for a couple of weeks. Um, it doesn't matter if you miss a few weeks, just do as many weeks as you can, because what we find is the birds that you will see next week and the next couple of weeks um, and the numbers of them is going to be quite different to what you see in January and what you see in February. So it gives us a much better idea. The more weeks you do, it gives us a better idea of how all those species are doing. Um, the rules for the survey are you count the birds that are using your garden. Um, they can be on your bird feeders. That's great. That's easy. They don't have to be on your bird feeders. Some species like to walk around in the grass or walk around on the on the tarmac, on the yard. You can count those birds as well, as long as they're using your garden in some way. You don't count birds that are just flying over your garden. Some people might be lucky enough to have swans or geese or, or something like that flying over your school or over your garden. You don't count them because they're not using your garden. They're just flying over it. Um, when it comes to a garden in, in a school context, you can, uh, what I would suggest is you pick an area maybe with some trees where you're putting out some bird food um, and some area around that. I wouldn't use the whole school grounds. You want something that is consistent that you can keep an eye on day to day and week to week and that the, the boundary doesn't change. So you can't say we're going to add that football pitch in because in week four, a lot of Brent geese landed in it. So pick an area that you can keep an eye on from inside and stick to that area for the whole survey. Um, and it can be as big or as, as small as you want, but just try and be consistent with that. So I'd suggest somewhere maybe with a few trees, maybe with a bit of grass and even a bit of, a bit of tarmac, but a yard is absolutely fine. So the rules are you count the highest number of each species that you see at any one time that week. So that sounds a little bit complicated, but it, it's it's pretty easy. So these birds here are starlings. If you see five starlings at nine o'clock in the morning, and you look out again later at three o'clock and you see two starlings. You've the highest number you've seen at any one time is five. So those two starlings later it might have been some of the ones that were there in the morning. So you don't add those numbers together. So the highest number you've seen at any one time is five. So that is the number of starlings that you're going to be trying to beat for the rest of the week. And if that's the highest number you've seen, that's the one you write down. Um, if you see, for example, if you see one blue tit today and you see two blue tits tomorrow and two blue tits the next day. You don't add them together. Two is the highest you've seen at any one time. So that's the number of blue tits that you write down. So you never add from different times of the day and you never add different days of the week. It's whatever. When you're looking out, the highest number you see at one time. One of the questions we always get in Birdwatch Ireland is what is the best food to put out for birds? And just like people, different birds have different preferences. Some of them absolutely love one type of food. Some of them don't like that one that much. Um, they all have their different preferences. And, you know, when you learn more about the birds, you see they have different shaped beaks, for example, to help them get the food that they really, really prefer. The best one, in my opinion, is sunflower seeds. Um, all of the birds love sunflower seeds, every single one of them. Um, they're not that messy. Some of the bird food you can get can be quite messy. Some of the seed mixes have some sunflower seeds, which the birds love, and they have other seeds and grains that the birds don't love as much. So they kind of throw that to the side and just stick to the stuff that they really like. Um, 
You can get sunflower seeds called sunflower hearts, and that is basically the seeds where the shell has already been taken off, and there's you know no mess or waste with them. They're really high in calories, and that's what the birds need. The birds need to eat a lot of food to put on fat over the winter to stay warm um, and to keep going. So sunflower seeds are really, really good for that. So in my garden, I always have sunflower seeds out all winter, and I get a great mix of birds um, coming to that. The next best one I would suggest is peanuts. Um, the vast majority of the birds love that. You can see a blue tit here in the top and a goldfinch in the bottom left uh, and a house sparrow and a greenfinch on the bottom right there. So a real nice mix of species. Love the peanuts too. There's no mess because they don't fall on the ground at all. They're in these nice cage feeders. They're pretty cheap um, to buy. And again, in terms of calories, in terms of the birds trying to put on fat over the winter, peanuts are really, really good for that. Um. Some things to be careful of, if you have any mouldy peanuts or anything that are shriveled up, um, it's important not to put them out. They can make the birds sick. Um, the other thing is you might have peanuts at home that have salt on them that you like as a snack, um, but that is very, very bad for the birds. So never give the birds anything that has salt on it. Um, in some shops, they sell a, a special type of peanut butter that you can put out for the birds. Um, you don't need to put that out. I think the normal peanuts are just fine. But again, if you are putting out that peanut butter, make sure it's specially for birds. Don't put out the peanut butter that you have at home because that's going to have salt in it and that is bad for the birds. So the two best things, I think, are, are sunflower seeds and peanuts. But also you can put out some things that you might have in the kitchen, you might have in the fruit bowl, some of the thrushes. So we have four or five species of thrush in Ireland, five species. One of them is the blackbird. We have the song thrush, the missile thrush. Um, red wing and field fair. So there are five species of thrush. The one on the top there is a field fair. Um, they love apples. They love pears. They love grapes. Um, they'll even eat bananas. So you can chop them up and you can stick them onto a branch like the one on the top photo there. Um, or you can just chop them up and put them on the ground. And those bigger birds um, tend to really, really like that. And especially in the cold, frosty weather where the ground is frozen and they can't get worms or anything like that. Fruit can be something that's really, really good. Another thing you might have in your kitchen cupboard at home are sultanas and raisins and currants. Um, a lot of people use them in you know Christmas cake at this time of year. Um, if you've got a spare packet of them, Again, those those thrushes and some other species like robins and a black cap, which is the one on the bottom photo there, they really love those kind of things too. So you don't have to go to the shop and get special bird food. There's some stuff you're going to have in your kitchen at home that the birds will love too. You can put out uncooked porridge oats. You can throw them on the lawn. Um, a little bit of grated cheese. Some of the smaller birds like a little bit of grated cheese. Um, and you can put out bits like rice and, and bread and stuff like that too. Make sure the rice um, is has no salt in it because, again, salt can make the birds sick. Um, bread, don't put out mouldy bread, um, but you can throw out things like that. And especially if you know that there's some cold weather coming, the birds will really, really appreciate those kind of bird foods. One thing that is great fun to do, it's a little bit messy, but it is great fun. You can make your own fat balls. So you get a, a block of what's called beef dripping. It's usually in supermarkets near the butter. And you just get it in your hands and you mash it together and it starts off like a block. But as you mash it and your hands are a little bit warm and they make that softer and softer and then you get some bird seed or you get some porridge oats or you get some raisins and you just squash it into that. Um, and you can also put a little bit of string in, which means you'll be able to hang that from a tree. So essentially you just squash all those ingredients into it, make this big ball of, of um, all the seeds and raisins and whatever else you put in, put that in the fridge for an hour or two and then you can hang that up for the birds and the birds love that. Um, another question we get from people is, I've put out loads of bird food and I've put out bird feeders, but none of the birds are using it. Why is that? So if you have a, a little garden like this, you might be tempted to put your bird feeders right in the middle of the lawn where you get a really, really good view of all the birds that come. But if you think like a small bird, small birds are worried that maybe a sparrowhawk or a bird of prey is going to come and catch them. So you have to be thinking like a bird and what you need to do is put your feeders within a few feet of the edge of the garden here where they're near trees and they're near bushes. And that means they'll be less scared. They don't have to come right out into the open and they know that if a bird of prey or something like that comes past, that they've only got a short distance to fly to safety, to fly into a tree or to fly into a bush. So if you're finding that you're not having much luck with your bird feeders, Give them a few days. Sometimes it takes birds a few days to find them. But otherwise, I would make sure that you're nice and close to some good trees or some good bushes. Um, so that's kind of the the, the basics of the survey um, and a few tips in terms of trying to feed the birds and attract the birds. I'm going to take you through some of the most common birds that are seen in the survey each year. 
Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but I'll go through a few of them. So here, the top three we have this year, or the top three based on last year. So it was nearly 2,000 gardens right across the country that took part in the survey last year. And the most common bird was the robin. Robins are really, really common. Um, you'd be, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them already. You'll see them on Christmas cards and Christmas decorations around this time of year. A nice um, orangey red front uh, and a brown back. And they kind of, they will, sometimes they'll land on bird feeders, but a lot of time they just um, hop around in bushes and hedges and they'll hop around on the ground as well. The second most common one then is the blackbird. Um, so the males are black. They have a lovely orange bill and a lovely orange ring around their eye. Again, they don't want really go to bird feeders, but you'll see them bouncing around on the grass, usually looking for worms and stuff. But again, they love apples and they will eat some bird seed and stuff like that, too. The one on the right there then is a blue tit. Um, they're absolutely tiny. They only weigh around 10 grams. So they would fit in your hand. No problem. They're really, really small. Um, and obviously there's a clue in the name there. You can see the nice blue cap on the top of its head. Um, and that's how you identify a blue tit. So they've got lovely blues and yellows and greens, but the blue is the most kind of um, obvious feature for them. So if you see a small little bird, these birds do not hop around on, on the ground or anything like that. They will stay up in the trees or stay on the bird feeders. Um, but they are the third most common um, bird in gardens all across Ireland. Just on the blackbird, just to warn you when you're trying to identify a blackbird, they're called a blackbird, so you expect them to be black, but it's only the males that are black. The females are actually a nice brown color. Um, so the one on the top there is a male, a nice black color, a nice orange beak. The one on the bottom is a female, so the beak is a bit duller, um, but they're lovely brown color. Um, if you're having trouble identifying them, I suppose what you would see is, you know, you'd know the, the male on the top, maybe, and the one on the bottom, it'll be acting like the male. It'll be hopping around on the ground, probably on its own. Um, they're, you know, bigger than robins, you know, they're much bigger than robins, but smaller than a crow. So if you see a, a bird that's all brown and it's acting like a blackbird, good chance it's a female blackbird. Some of the next most common birds, I'm sure a lot of you know what a magpie looks like, nice black and white colours. You're not going to mix that up with anything. They have a lovely long tail. Um, they can be quite noisy at times, quite, uh, they make a kind of a rattling kind of call, um, but they're beautiful birds. Next on the list, then, in fifth place is the great tit. So that's related to the blue tit, but you can see it looks quite different. It's got this black and white head. Um, it has a yellow belly, uh, the same as the blue tit, but it's actually it's about twice as big as the blue tit. So they're a nice, chunky little bird. Um, and then you have the chaffinch. So the likes of the tits and the robins and the blackbirds, you probably see ones and twos. You might see three or four. The chaffinch here on the very right-hand side, they occur in flocks. So you're unlikely to see one or two. You're much more likely to see four, five, six, seven, eight. Some people can have 10, 20, 30 um, chaffinches because they're a species that likes to flock. So that's another clue when you're trying to identify species. Is it on its own or is it on a flock? A lot of our finch species like to flock. So just to look at the, the three tit species. So I mentioned the blue tit and you can see it there on the left. A lovely blue cap is the most obvious feature and blue on the wings as well. The great tit in the middle, it's about twice the size of a blue tit. It's got that black and white head and it's got a nice um, black stripe down its belly. And then the one on the right there is a coal tit. So that kind of looks like a great tit, but it's actually quite small. It's about the size of a blue tit. Um, it has a black and white head like the great tit, but you can see the colours are much more dull, much more pale. So it's like it's been down a coal mine or something like that. So there are ones to look out for. And with the chaffinches, just like the blackbirds, there's two different types of chaffinch that you might see. A male one, which is on the bottom photo there, um, kind of an orangey, reddy kind of colour with a kind of a bluey grey cap or hood. Um, and the females then are a more plain brown colour. But what you'll see is you might see a few males and you'd be wondering what's this other species mixed in with them. But if they're hanging out together in big numbers, um, you know, look out for these two different types, but they're all the same species. Further down the list then, the house sparrow. House sparrows are quite common. They love peanut feeders and they love seed feeders in particular. Sometimes they will land on the ground underneath the feeders, um, but most of the time up in the trees and the bushes. The goldfinch, you're not going to mix them up with anything. They've got this lovely yellowy gold patch on their wings. They have a lovely red face. Um, 
And just like the chaffinches, goldfinches occur in flocks. So you're unlikely to see one or two. You'll probably see five or six or, or 10 or 15 of them together. Um, and the name for a flock of goldfinches is called a charm. And if you listen out, the goldfinches have a really, really lovely, it's almost like bells ringing. And it's, it's really, really nice, gentle call. Um, and they're very chatty. Any of the species that occur in flocks are very chatty because they're kind of talking to each other the whole time saying, I'm over here, I'm over here, where are you going? You know, that kind of stuff. Another common one then in the winter is the starling. Um, they are about the size of a blackbird, but they have a much shorter tail. Um, blackbirds kind of occur in ones and twos and threes. Starlings will be in flocks. You, you tend to get five, six, seven, eight, and they'll be all hanging out together. Um, they have a very short tail. They love the fruit that you might put out, and they love the fat balls that you might make and hang out. Um, they'll also eat other, other scraps and bread and stuff like that if you throw that out too. You'll quite often see them on the tops of um, roofs and the tops of chimneys and stuff like that and, and they're very chatty as well. And again, just another species where the male and the female look different but it's the same species as the house sparrow. So on the bottom there is the male and the top it's the female and you can see the back of both birds looks quite similar. you got browns and blacks and greys and stuff like that nice patterns but the head is very different so the male has this dark brown you know um, back to the head with a little bit of greyish colour and kind of a, a black mask almost across the eye and under the beak whereas the female doesn't have any of that it's more of a plain stripy brown head but again you'll see them mixing in, in together and if you say well listen I, I you know I know that they're those ones are definitely house sparrows and I you know I think those other ones hanging out with them they look similar enough I'm pretty sure they're house sparrows too other species, uh, I'm sure a lot of you, of you are familiar with the wren. They're absolutely tiny. and um, That's the bird on the left there. Really, really small. They're the second smallest species we have in Ireland. They have a the little pointy tail. They quite often stick their tail up in the air like that. Um, they're not a bird that's going to land on your bird feeders, and they probably won't even hang around underneath your bird feeders. They are a species that you'll see usually in hedges. And they make a little, little high-pitched call, and you'll see them just flitting around really fast, bouncing around in the hedge. Um, but it, it's a good lesson maybe to not just keep an eye on the feeders and not just keep an eye on what's happening on the grass, but do have a good look in, in the hedges and stuff too to see what might be hanging out in there. The one in the middle then is a dunnock. So that was the uh, in number 11 last year in the rankings, and that moved up two places. They are about the size of a robin. They're very dull colours. They don't have any of the reds or any of the, the bright colours of some of the other birds. Um, but they hang out in the same areas as the robin. So sometimes on bird feeders, but usually underneath bird feeders. Um, so if you see a dull, especially on a dull winter's day, they can look very dull and it's hard to pick out any identifying features of them. Um, but just keep Dunnock in mind as one to look out for. Some people used to call them a hedge sparrow, but they're actually not related to the other sparrows. So we call them a Dunnock. Um, and then the one on the right there is the coltis. I showed you that one earlier. Um, it's very dull colours. It's got the black and white face, but very dull browns and kind of creamy colours. Uh, and they're very small. They love the bird feeders. So you're not going to get them on the ground. They're going to be coming to the bird feeders. And because they're one of the smallest birds that use bird feeders, um, they usually kind of come very quickly. They'll grab a seed or grab a little bit of peanut and fly away very quickly because some of the other birds kind of push them out of the way a little bit because they're so small. So if you see a bird that's really, really quick coming and going. And one of the other things that cold tits do is they hide food. So because they're so small, they kind of say, I might not get a chance to come back to this bird feeder. You know, there might be too many, too many other birds here. So they will grab some seed, fly away, hide it somewhere for later, and they come and get another seed. So sometimes you'll see them coming and going, coming and going really, really quickly. So I'm not going to go through all the species, but these are the three pigeons you're most likely to see um, in your garden or in your school. So you have the wood pigeon, which is our kind of natural wild pigeon species. They're all over the country. They're quite big birds. And you see the, you know, kind of a dull grayish color, but that white patch on the neck uh, is really, really good way to pick them out. Sometimes you'll see them go through football pitches and, and kind of longer grass looking for insects and bits of vegetation and stuff like that and they just kind of walk through it um but they will if you have seeds and stuff put out they will start um coming in for that as well the collared dove they tend to come to feeders especially with the seeds spilling out of the feeders maybe and falling on the ground very pale color a lovely red eye and you can see where they get the name that lovely little collar around their neck so they're quite common they're top 16 um birds in the country and then you have the feral pigeon that's the one on the right so they can look quite different 
And it's not that, you know, one is a male and another is a female. Just there's a lot of variation. A lot of the other species, all collared doves look the same. But the feral pigeons, and you tend to get them mostly in towns and cities um, and in some parks and stuff like that too. And you can get big flocks of them. Um, they can look a little bit more grey or a little bit more black. You know, it kind of depends. And you might see a flock and of 20 feral pigeons. And they all look a little bit different, but that's what they are. They're feral pigeons. And you can see that little bit of white above their bill. That's a good giveaway. And you see they're missing the white patch on the neck that the wood pigeon has. So the three pigeon species, they're some of the bigger birds you'll get in your in your garden or in your school. Um, these are the three crows you're most likely to see. I mentioned the magpie earlier, which is a member of the crow family. But here we've got, in order, we've got the jackdaw, we've got the rook, and we've got the hooded crow. So the jackdaw is... It's, you know, a couple of times bigger than a blackbird. So they, you know, they're big enough birds. Um, You can see they have a very pale eye and they've got this little black cap. So they're black all over, but they're just a bit more black on the top of the head. And kind of a, I would say a kind of a triangular bill, a black triangular bill. Um, the rook, on the other hand, is a bit bigger than the jackdaw. And you can see they've got this long pointed grey bill. Um. And they're black as well, but you can see the black of, of the rook there is quite kind of a purpley, bluey black color. And then the hooded crow is really, really easy. It looks like it's got a black hood and kind of a, a gray jacket on it. Um, but all of these, you know, will visit your yard, will visit your school, will visit your garden too. And then some other ones to keep an eye out for. So the green finch on the left is a member of the finch family. Um they are one of the garden birds that has declined the most in recent years. So the garden bird survey, because people have sent us all their sightings of, of the birds in the garden for over 30 years now, we've been able to see that greenfinch were, used to do great and used to be one of the most common birds in gardens. But each year for the last 20 years, they've been going down and down and down and down in numbers. Um, so they're doing really badly. And um, they do like peanut feeders, they do like seed feeders. So there's a good chance you might get them visiting if you're lucky. Um, a sparrowhawk in the middle so they're a bird of prey they are a bird of prey that's built for hunting in woodlands but they often come to gardens and stuff too um if you're lucky you'll get one sitting around like that and you get to watch it and look at it and, and really look at all its features quite often you'll just see this biggish bird flying through really really quickly near your bird feeders all the other birds scattering um and if you see that, it was a sparrowhawk. The other bird of prey you might see is a buzzard, but you'll see them you know, landing on, on telegraph poles or circling high in the sky, but they don't fly fast and they don't fly low. Uh, and then the one on the right there is a long-tailed tit. So the, the photo doesn't really show it, but the name obviously gives it away. They have a very, very long tail. They're like a little ball of cotton wool uh, with a really, really long tail. Some people call them flying teaspoons because that's kind of the shape that they have. And they hang out in family groups. So you'll get a big flock of maybe 10 or 20 long-tailed tits. And that is a, a mother and a father and sons and daughters and cousins and aunties and uncles all hanging out together for the winter. So the type of things that influence the birds in your garden, it's the habitats in the area all around your garden or all around your school. It's also the habitats in your garden. So you could have loads of woodland around you that has loads of blue tits. But if you don't have any nice bushes or trees in your garden, you're not going to get any blue tits. So it's the habitats around you, but also the habitats in your garden. The food you provide, like I said, some birds prefer some foods and others prefer others. Um, the food available in the countryside. So if there's loads of seeds and nuts on the trees, um, certainly in the autumn, we see that. There's very few birds coming into gardens in the autumn because all of those trees all over the countryside have loads of seeds and nuts for them. So if they don't need to come into gardens, they won't. If there's loads of if nature is providing loads of, of food for them and berries and stuff too, they won't come in. Um, if the birds had a good nesting season. So sometimes you could have twice as many house sparrows as you did last year. And that might be because they had really good nesting success. All their nests, they fledged loads of, loads of chicks and just means there's more birds around. Uh, and then the weather is the other thing. So if you pick a really cold, frosty day, you're going to get more birds in your garden because they're really hungry. They want to get food as quickly and easily as they can. Maybe, you know, species like blackbirds and song thrushes usually feed in fields, but those fields are frozen over so they can't get any worms or insects in them. So they're going to come to your garden looking for food. So there's a load of different things that influence what you see in your garden. This is a graph and it's the 13 weeks of the garden bird survey a few years ago. And in the last week of the survey, there was heavy snow for three or four days. So what we saw is every week, roughly the same number of gardens had song thrushes and missile thrushes and their cousins, the Red Wing and the Field Fair. Pretty same, you know, some, some weeks, you know, less than others. 
But then that last week when there was loads of snow, the numbers of all these species in gardens doubled because they all came into gardens looking for food. So it just goes to show the, the difference that the weather can make to the, the birds that you'll see. Um, just for teachers, there's a link there, and you know, we can send you the link in the presentation afterwards. Um, there's a poster that our, our the Birdwatch Ireland Cork branch have developed, and that has a lot of the common species you'll see. So you can download that and print that from the Birdwatch Cork website. Um, we do also we have a Birdwatch Ireland shop, and we have posters there, and we have bird ID guides and a bird book. Um, it could be a really good investment for the sake of 15 quid um, or thereabouts to have a, a bird book that you can refer to. Um, there's also the Birdwatch Ireland website. So, you know, you can go to the Ireland's birds section of the website and we've got a profile on every single bird you'll see in Ireland. Um, one tip I would say is when you're looking for birds, so don't just Google birds. If you go to the Birdwatch Ireland website, you're better off because if you put a thrush into Google and start looking for features, Google has this a bias towards America. Um, so we often get reports of, oh, I just saw this American species of thrush. And it's like, no, no, it's very similar to our native song thrush. Um, but it's just the way Google has diverted you. So check out the Birdwatch Ireland website, the Ireland's bird section. And there's a bit on every bird there. And um, there's loads of photos. There's maps that show you kind of where they occur. Um, and obviously, if you look at the Garden Bird Survey results, you know, the more common the species is, the more likely it is the one that you saw. So, for example, we have two species of sparrow in Ireland. We have the house sparrow and the tree sparrow. The tree sparrow is much, much rarer and really only occurs in the east of the country. So if you're trying to decide which sparrow you saw, it's more than likely the common one, which is the house sparrow. Um, but do check out the website for all that. Um, the garden bird survey section of the website. You can submit your counts online if you want. Um, there's some more tips and more details about feeding your garden birds and the advantages and disadvantages of different foods. Um, and there's more um, frequently asked questions about taking part in the survey if you're kind of not quite sure about how to, to go about it. Just all the questions are hopefully answered there. We also have a news section on our website. And if you pick out the category of garden birds, you'll find some articles that I wrote um, over the last few years and loads of facts and figures about different garden birds. So that map there is all of the locations that Irish blackbirds have been found in other countries. So we have blackbirds that nest in Ireland. But in winter, we get some that come from all the way from Scandinavia, from Northern Europe and from the UK that come to Ireland to spend the winter. A lot of people don't know that. And there's a lot of other species that do something similar. Um, so you'll see all of these blogs. How far do garden birds travel? How much do garden birds weigh? Um, how long do garden birds live for? Another thing, they're collective nouns for garden birds. So I mentioned already a charm of goldfinches is one. You know, people know a murder of crows, and but there's a few nice, interesting ones there too. Uh, and then there's one in the middle there, how things changed over the years. So the garden bird survey is going for 35 years. So, so we've just discussed some species that are doing really well and some species not doing so well. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but if you want a much, much longer version of this talk, uh, there's one on YouTube. So if you find this one, garden bird survey webinar, I did that um, a couple of years ago. Um, and that goes into everything I've discussed here in, in much more detail. Um, so yeah, listen, it'd be great if you all get involved in the survey this winter. Um, if you do it from the school, if a few of you are able to do it from home as well, it can be really interesting to compare what you're seeing between gardens and what you see at home versus what you see in the school. Um, from our point of view, the more people who do the survey, the more we know about the birds of Ireland and how they're doing. Um, so the more the merrier. Um, all the details are on the website. And if anyone has any questions at any stage, just fire me an email and I will happily answer them. There we go. Hopefully I'm not, not too bad for time, a little bit over, but. That's brilliant. Thanks, Emily and Brian. Um, there's there's a lot to take in there, but it was brilliant to get um, all of that information. Um, I really enjoyed it anyway. Um, so we might just open it up if anybody has um, any questions for Brian about doing the survey or identifying different birds or his favourite birds or anything like that. Feel free to put them in the, the chat box now. Um, and we can uh, put them to Brian. I might just ask a question while I'm giving you a chance to do that. Um, you mentioned a few different birds that um, the male and the female look different. What uh, What's the reason behind that? Is there any reason the, the males are usually more colourful than the females? Or what's yeah, going on I suppose when it comes to nesting, the females do a lot of the hard work 
they do, you know, they lay the eggs and they incubate the chicks and stuff like that. So the males have to prove that they're going to be a really, really good mate. So if you look at the likes of blue tits, for example, they look the same, but actually to blue tits, the males look much brighter because they have to be able to show that they eat more caterpillars. They're really good at finding caterpillars that gives them brighter colors and that lets them show off and say, listen, if we have a load of chicks, I'm going to be really good at finding caterpillars. Um, so a lot of it tends to be is stuff like that is is um, the males having to do some attracting and, and show off a little bit. Brilliant. So we have a good few questions coming in now. So um, Tynock National School is asking, what does a kite bird eat? So red bird. kites, they are birds of prey, but they do a lot of scavenging. So sometimes they will catch small mammals. They'll catch mice and rats and stuff like that. But a lot of the time they'll eat stuff that's already dead you know roadkill and stuff like that and bits of meat um sometimes they'll even just eat worms so in the winter fields tend to be very wet and it's easy to find worms so sometimes they'll just eat worms but they're like buzzards buzzards have a, a similar diet where they don't catch all of their food sometimes the food is kind of dead already or sometimes they'll just go for worms which are really really easy brilliant um and then we have another question here how long do birds typically live um so it depends all, all the birds it kind of it varies a little bit a lot of the garden birds you'll see it's kind of three or four years for the crows and the pigeons it can be 10 15 years if they're really really lucky um i'm sure some of you get some gulls visiting your schoolyard they can live up to 30 or 35 years but there's a there is an article on the website about that if anyone wants to look into it in more detail where i list out the ages but for your robins and your blue tits and stuff like that you're talking three or four years brilliant um, and then Cliffany National School asks, what is the rarest bird in Ireland? Um, so there's a lot of different ways to answer that. I would say one of our rarest breeding birds is a bird called the ring oozel. We've only got less than 10 pairs left in the entire country. And they are a blackbird, but a blackbird with a nice white bib, so a white front here. And they nest essentially at the top of mountains. So they're really, really rare. It's only the mountains in Kerry and Donegal, and there's only a few pairs of them. Some Another way to answer that would be some rare birds that don't usually turn up in Ireland, but have accidentally ended up here. They kind of got lost. So last, or no, two winters ago, we had an Egyptian vulture that came all the way from Europe, kind of got a bit lost, and it showed up in Donegal, and then it showed up in Mayo, and then it showed up in Roscommon, um, and then it kind of disappeared. But that was just, it was the first one ever seen in Ireland, uh, and that was really, really rare. Brilliant. And then Dunboyne um, Primary School ask, um, what other birds of prey are there in Ireland besides the ones you've already mentioned? Okay, so I mentioned the red kite and the buzzard. We've also got some eagles. So we've got a few golden eagles, and we've got lots of white-tailed eagles. So they are absolutely huge. I remember seeing a white-tailed eagle in a tree before. I thought it was a person sitting in a tree. I was like, why is that person sitting in a tree? I was like, oh, wait, it's a white-tailed eagle. They're huge. Um, they like to eat fish, but they'll also eat stuff like rabbits and rats and stuff like that too. We've also got, so I mentioned the sparrowhawk. Uh, we've also got members of the falcon family. So we've got peregrine falcon, and they nest on cliffs. We've got kestrels. So you, sometimes you'll see kestrels at the side of a road and they kind of hover in the air. They stay in the exact same place in the air and they're just kind of scanning, looking for mice and stuff like that too. Um, in the winter, we've also got a bird called the merlin, which is another member of the falcon family. They nest in bogs and on mountains. Um, what else have we got? We've got the hen harrier, which looks like a mix between a buzzard and an owl. They've got this kind of round head. Um, and then we've got the owl species. So we've got the barn owl, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. The long-eared owl, which is actually more common than the barn owl, but they're very secretive, so most people don't even know about them. And then we've got the short-eared owl, and they don't really come here in the summer. There's a few of them here in the summer, but in the winter we get them coming here from Scotland and from Scandinavia. And this year is a really, really good year for them. So there's loads of short-eared owls flying around the country at the moment. Brilliant. That's a long list for you guys to look into now. Um, and then you have the same question from two classes. So Glebe National School and Mr. Coins class both ask you, what is your favourite bird and why? Oh, I, when I was growing up, my favourite bird was the kestrel. And it was because it was the bird of prey that was easiest to see. And I just really liked the way they hunt, the way they can do this hovering thing that no other bird can do. I think at the moment, in terms of garden birds, my favourite bird is the blackbird. And um, like I said earlier, 
some of them migrate to Ireland. So if you're looking at a blackbird in your garden, it could be from just down the road or it could be from hundreds of kilometers away and travel a huge distance to get to your garden in the winter. And I just think that's really, really cool. You know, it's a really, really interesting way to go about things. Very cool. Um, and then Clonine National School asks, should we only feed birds in the winter? Winter is when the birds need the most help. But it's fine to feed them all year round if you want to. I feed my birds all year round, but I put out a lot more food in the winter than I do in the spring and the summer. Very good. Yeah, I think that's a question that comes up a lot. So that's really good to know. Um, and Holy Cross School says that um, their committee is asking how many different types of birds could we expect to find in a school in a town area? Um, so you'd be surprised, like um, urban and suburban areas can get quite a lot of birds. It really depends on kind of tree cover and stuff like that. I would say on average in the survey, gardens tend to get between 15 and 25 bird species. So what I would say is keep your feeders topped up. And if you've got a few trees and a few bushes and if you've got a nice corner for a garden, you could get you should get 15 species anyway, if you, if you keep an eye on it. Very good. That's a good aim for for you guys. Um, and I noticed was asking, why are birds different colours? That's a tricky one. That's a really tricky one. Um, it's, uh, yeah, geez, it's hard to know. Um, I suppose, you know, all birds do different things and they want to, you know, attract each other and they want to hang out with each other. So it's kind of like all schools having different uniforms, for example, so that, you know, you know that boy or that girl goes to that school and you know I, I should be over there with them I shouldn't be with this other school so it's maybe a little bit of that but yeah it, it's a that's a big complex question that we're not going to get answer here unfortunately it's nice to have them in different colors though I think we can agree I it's nice yeah. to see the color ones um yeah I think we're really really lucky if you take a look you realize wow you know some of these the colors like of a blue tit even they're really common but they're absolutely gorgeous mm -hmm, definitely um, and then Largy National School asks, what happens when a bird has salty food? You mentioned so, them. Um, so we eat stuff with salt in it um, and that's fine. But if we eat a load of salt, it'll make us quite sick. Um, it makes you essentially it makes you very, very thirsty and makes you feel very, very sick. Um, so we can eat, we'll say, a few grams of salt and then it'll start to make us sick. But because birds are tiny, a lot of them only weigh about 10 grams, it means they can only eat a really, 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 really tiny amount of salt um, before it starts to make them sick. So it makes them sick in the same way it makes us sick, but just we're able to eat a bit more before it happens us. But because they're so tiny, you know, a few little bits of salt to make them sick. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And then another question from Tynak National School. How long does a crow live for? So class. about 20 years, there was, um, so I'm a, what's called a, a bird ringer. So I am trained and licensed to catch wild birds, put a little tag on their leg and let them go again. And my trainer, the guy who trained me up, caught a jackdaw and he caught the same jackdaw 18 years later in his garden. So it was the same jackdaw. So the crows can live about 20 years. Oh, that's brilliant. A very long time. Um. And how about how far can a robin fly? It's another hard one. In some parts of the world, the robins migrate. So in some places where they get snow in the winter, the robins are like, we got to get out of here for the winter. And they will fly hundreds of kilometers to nice warm countries. In Ireland, our robins don't fly very far at all. They will stay within a few kilometers. They'll stay in the same town or the same parish or the same area for their whole lives. So in Ireland, they'll fly a few kilometers. But really, wherever they hatch, they kind of say, I'll find somewhere nice around here. They don't go that far. Okay, so a bit like people, they could go far or stay near their home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And then we have two similar questions. So one class asks, what is the biggest bird in Ireland? And another asks, what is the smallest bird in Ireland? Um, so the answer to the biggest bird used to be the mute swan, which is the swan you'll see all over the country in ponds and lakes and stuff like that. Um. I'm not sure now, the white-tailed seagull might be a bit bigger or it might depend on how you measure it. So a mute swan weighs around 10 kilograms, which is quite heavy. They have really big wings, but the white-tailed eagle has huge wings. Um, so it's one of those two for the biggest. Um, I'd have to look it up. The smallest one we have is called the gold crest. And they are like just a tiny little fraction smaller than a wren. Um, and you will get them, like the wren, you'll see them hopping around in hedges and bushes and stuff like that too. And they're quite common but because they're so small, people miss them a lot. Brilliant. So sorry, there's loads of questions in here for you, Brian. It's great to see people have so many great questions. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Coins class asks, is there any bird that is unique to Ireland that you wouldn't find in other countries? 
So there's nothing, no species that's unique, but we do have unique subspecies, which means, you know, they're, so there's four subspecies of birds that are native to Ireland. So we have the coal tit, which is one I, I showed you earlier. So essentially the Irish coal tits look a bit different and act a little bit different to the coal tits in the UK or in Europe. So we have the coal tit, we have the red grouse. Again, our red grouse are a little bit different genetically um, to red grouse in other countries. For example, the ones in other countries will turn white in the winter, but the Irish birds don't do that. Um, trying to remember now, the dipper is another one. Dipper, it looks like a it looks like a mix between a robin and a black or no, between a wren and I a I have a picture of a dipper here. We've got a picture of a dipper, share. great. So they hang out on rivers. You'll see them bouncing up and down on rocks um along rivers. So we've a, an Irish species, a, a subspecies of dipper. And what is the other one? The jay. The jay is a member of the crow family, but it's really, really colorful. It doesn't look like a crow at all. It does sound like a magpie. But again, the, the jays in Ireland are a little bit different. So the Irish subspecies tend to have the word hibernicus, like hibernia, you know, name for Ireland, um, at the end of their name. Um, so we do have four subspecies that are unique to Ireland. And the cultid, so, you know, there's a chance to get all them in your garden, but the cultid is quite common in gardens. So it's really, really cool to see this unique Irish subspecies in your garden. Brilliant. That's really interesting. Um, what, what do we have next? It, is it safe to feed birds household leftovers? Um, as long as it's not too greasy, because grease gets on their feathers and causes problems. And as long as it's not too salty, yes, it should be fine. Um, yeah, bits and pieces that aren't really salty or aren't greasy and stuff like that are fine. Yeah. Brilliant. So we'll just do a couple more because I know we're going over time. Um, are barn owls common in North Leitrim? Do you know what? They're not that common in North Leitrim at the moment. So I'm from Roscommon, not too far away from Leitrim. Um, and there's a few places that are good for, for barn owls in Roscommon. Um, I have a colleague called John Lesby, and his job is to look at owls and birds of prey all across the country, all year round. So he's done a load of surveys, and he's seeing the barn owls are actually doing really well at the moment. And we have some invasive species. They're called um, shrews and voles, so they're like mice. And they're spreading across the country. And as they spread, it gives more food for the barn owls and there's more barn owls as a result. So I would say in Leitrim, there aren't that many barn owls at the moment, but I'd say in the coming years, there's probably going to be more. Okay, very good. I'll have now two, there's two good questions here about kind of the technical side. So one is how often should we um, clean our bird feeders? And the second one kind of similar, if you have no trees or bushes, where is a good place to put your bird feeders? Um, cleaning the bird feeders if you can do it once a week that's really really good um, some feeders will need more cleaning than others um, but uh, if you can do it once a week you know a bit of washing up liquid um, and, and you know take it apart and put it back together once a week is great um, if you've no trees or bushes uh, that's a tricky one I'd have to, I'd nearly have to see the garden or see the, the schoolyard to know but you want it close to some cover so I'd be looking even outside the school, where is, are there trees and bushes? You know, it might be a wall or something like that, but you might be quite limited if you don't, if you don't have any trees or bushes, but you might, you might even have to, you know, experiment and, you know, put the feeders in one spot for two weeks and move them, you know, if that doesn't work, but you can still throw out things like bread and, 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 you know, I say the, the fruit and stuff like that, and you'll still get crows and pigeons and thrushes and stuff like that. And, you know, you could get up to 15 species just with those three groups. Brilliant. So we'll just do one or two more because I know lots of people have, have to move on to other things. And um, so here's um interesting one. Can birds swim? Uh, some birds can swim. Some birds are really, really good at swimming because they catch fish. So they need to be really, really good at swimming. And um, the birds that need to swim tend to have ways to make their feathers waterproof. So robins don't have webbed feet, for example, so they're not really able to kick and paddle, so they'd be bad at swimming, but also if they get wet, they will get really, really wet, they'll get soaked. Whereas if you have something like a duck or a swan, their feathers are waterproof and they've got webbed feet, so they're really good at swimming and they don't get too wet, they don't get too cold or anything like that. Yeah, and we'll finish with this very interesting one. Um, Again, might be a difficult one to answer for you, sorry, Brian, but are birds smart? Yeah, birds are really, really smart. Um, it's a really, really tough life to be a bird. Um, 
birds aren't good at maths. They're not good at learning Irish or learning Spanish or anything like that. But they're really smart at doing the things that they need to do to stay alive, to find a mate, to find food, all that kind of stuff. So they're they're really, really smart in ways that we're not really, really smart and we're smart in ways that they aren't. But, you know, it, it takes smart it smarts to be a bird, essentially. So, yeah, no, they're really, really good. Brilliant. Thanks, Amelia and Brian. And thanks so much to everyone for all of those um, great questions. It's brilliant to, to see the way you guys are, are thinking about birds and how you can learn more about them. Actually, to see Rob has put in a nice link there to uh, the video about yes, crows. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there's definitely some, you'll definitely notice some interesting bird behavior if you watch them carefully. Um, but yeah, thanks, like I said, thanks everyone for coming. Hopefully you give the, the survey a go. We've put a link to it in the chat um, and um, it will be up. It's up on the Birdwatch website and we'll have it up on our website as well. So um, if more questions do come up on the, the survey for Brian, um, you can get in touch with him or with us and we'll pass it on. Um, and yeah, best of luck with it. Hopefully you get a chance to go out and have a look and a listen for some birds um, this afternoon, maybe you're on your way home. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck with the survey and do let us know how you get on. We'll be really interested to hear how you go. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Emily and Brian. We really appreciated that. That was a really interesting talk. Thanks very much, everyone. Good luck with it. And yeah, just let me know if you have any problems. Great. Bye, everyone.